Great, great job singing tonight. So good to sing praises to our Lord, especially about that cross, what Jesus Christ did for us and what that means for us each and every day. Take your Bibles tonight. Turn to Genesis. We are going to get back at it. It's been a while, hasn't it? Uh, we're going to look at these scriptures, Genesis chapter 1. And uh, we kind of left off there on uh, the sixth day, if you will. And uh, this is just a, a, a message about a particular subject that we'll delve into in just a moment. Uh, and that's going to be really about the uniqueness of man. Uh, the uniqueness of man. We spent a little bit of time discussing all the days of creation. We uh, spent a little bit of time discussing even this part of creation, dealing with man. But tonight I want to delve right in here a bit and we'll see some review in just a moment and then we'll get to some really fresh material for us tonight, get our heads wrapped around all of this. But I want to begin uh, by looking just kind of through the, through the course of these first verses in Scripture as we start here in Genesis chapter for one Look at verse 26, familiar verses to you. We're going to read verse 26 and 27, and then we're going to jump ahead a little bit and read a couple others uh, that will just have context for all of tonight as well. So Genesis 1 verse 26 says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, a lot's been said about that making man in God's image. What I find interesting, and maybe you've seen this pattern I have as I've studied this, these first few verses in Genesis, but there are certain things that are repeated and when something's repeated, it's purposeful, right? God wants to get his, his message across to man. He, he doesn't want there to be any area where someone can say, wait a minute, we can question that or we can look at that or we can explain that differently. And he does this in verse 27. Now, it's quite a statement there in the first part of verse 26 where God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's quite a thing. That's quite a miraculous thing, if you will. And we're going to see all the intricacies of that in just a moment. But then God repeats that thought in verse 27 and says, then so God created. Notice it was a conversation first. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And as they really had that conversation of, hey, let us make man in our image. This is the next part of creation that we have to have. The Bible clearly clarifies then the very next thing he did was what they spoke about. He says, so God created man in his own image. Now look at the redundancy. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. See, I believe there's no speculation here. God's closing all the doors on what we'd consider theories of evolution, <laughs> theories of all of that other stuff. That door's closed right there. There's no goo, there's no goop. There's no animals and lizards and then monkeys and us. It's we were created in God's image. Yeah, yeah. This is a foundational truth of the Bible. This is a foundational truth to what you and I believe. And we live in a world where most people find themselves asking a couple familiar questions to you and I. That first question is, who am I? Right? Who am I? Next question, you could probably already fill it in, is what? Why am I here? The world asks that all the time. They contemplate this and whether they're seeking after God or whether they have a sense of spiritual things, it doesn't matter. I probably declare that everybody has this thought in their life at one time in their life. Who am I and why am I here? What's my purpose? And we spent a little bit of time talking about that Wednesday night as we kind of went through just a recap of Ecclesiastes and we talked about that we are here for God's pleasure. We're here because, one, he wanted us to be. He wanted a relationship with man. He wanted this special relationship with us so that in return we would glorify and honor him. What a responsibility that is. 
This God that created us in his image now wants a relationship with us and our response should be then to glorify him, to honor him with our life. You know, this answer is really not a mystery in Scripture. I believe even as we look at these verses, it's laid out here as to what God wanted when he created us. He wanted that relationship. Turn over really quick to Genesis chapter 2, and I want to look at verse 7. It kind of gives the, the foundation of this creation of Adam. 2 verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. We see that creation of Adam out of the dust of the ground and then God breathing in this man that uh, him, him then becoming a living soul. We'll discuss that in just a moment. Then turn over just a page in your, if it's in your Bible to verse 21. I had to turn a page. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So we see this creation, we see this forming of man, that first man, Adam, out of the dust of the ground and God breathing into him that breath of life and he becoming a living soul. We see then how God created Eve, that first woman, out of man, out of that bone and even that flesh of man and then she became woman. Only human beings are created in the image of God. We talked about this a few weeks back now. This is just for some quick review. In other words, the notion that dogs or cats or animals are people too, that's just not true. You know, it's a, we, we, we get caught up on cute things. I don't know why that's considered a cute thing, but it is. Oh, my puppy, look how cute it is. It's got to be just like me. It's not. <laughs> it's a dog. <laughs> I'm sorry. I like dogs. I'm an animal lover of sorts, but it's a dog. Was it uniquely made like you and I are? Although all of creation is wonderfully made. But man is different. We talked, and I want to go through this quickly again tonight, where man is unique because he was vastly different from all other living creatures. While we share life, only man was the beneficiary of God breathing into him the breath of life. This, that statement alone is awe-inspiring, isn't it? God breathed into us that breath of life. Our bodies are enormously more versatile and capable than other living things. We have emotion, range of feelings, reactions. Intellectually, we are superior creatures. Just how God created us. We talked about how man is unique and that God only made one man and one woman. All other living animals in water and air and then the land, God, as we read, made numerous pairs. We talked about those scriptures. We said that you know, they were abundant. They filled the air and the sea, but yet God made one man and one woman. What a foundation to life, if you will. What a foundation to the family. Something being missed in our society today. Say, so what's wrong with our society? What's wrong with our country? You need a mom and a dad in the lives of children. Two moms don't do it. Two dads don't do it. A different dad, a different mom, and I understand those things happen as far as the divorce end of it, but it's not how God intended it to be. Structure of the family is being destroyed. God made one man one woman. Man's creation was unique because it was a hands-on work by God, different from all other creation. He took that dust of the ground. There's that verbiage we talked about. He formed man from that dust of the ground, that potter with the clay, if you will, illustration. But that potter had the ability to breathe into his creation the breath of life. Isn't that amazing? Same with Eve taking part of man and forming Eve out of that. 
just for a little bit more review and then we'll be done with that. Man is unique and that he was given instruction. What were they to do? They were to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish. We said how this is more than just having lots of kids. This is man's responsibility to multiply with the mindset to protect and direct the next generation. I said I made a statement about this and we talked about it. This is instinctive in us. God gave us that instinct. That's why it's to be one man and one woman. He then gives the instruction to subdue the earth, to bring it under subjection. Man was to learn the earth systems. You know, when I studied that, it's even just profound to think of really how smart Adam was. He had a great responsibility to earn these, to, to learn and, and to, to be able then to uh, have that under subjection, those systems, those processes. He, he was to uh, organize and utilize his knowledge in productive ways to benefit mankind and all in the lens of honoring his creator. You know, we, we, we have this Sunday school sense of Adam and Eve, don't we? These two individuals just frolicking through the garden and, you know, no responsibility, just such a carefree. And man, I'm telling you, under, with no sin, with no, no uh, uh, flesh, no sin of the flesh, that must have been a tremendous thing. But yet there was responsibility. Then they were to have dominion or rule over the earth. We talked about how the one way rules is determined by the character of the one who does the ruling. God granted authority to Adam in this way. The biblical testimony is that God made man and woman with a uniqueness that was not present in the other things he created. Only men and women were created in God's image. Only human beings have a special honor and privilege. Only mankind had God breathed life into them. We are unique among all creation. One author said the God who made the stars and everything else in the universe also made us. In the midst of this overwhelming universe, God made us in a way that sets us apart from everything else he created. We may feel insignificant at times, but we are very significant indeed. What a thought that is. Those days you're maybe having a rough day. Those days maybe you're just a little downhearted. You ever consider how significant you are? to the creator of this universe. Let's consider how significant you are to a holy God that wants and desires a relationship with you. We were created differently. I said a moment ago, sadly, the world kind of contradicts this thinking. Evolution says we're here by chance. No order, no reason. Yet the truth of the scripture is that people are not a product of chance. There's no chance. God had a conversation and then God did. God said, hey, let us make man in our image. And the next thing we read is so God created man. We are a special creation, so much so that God knows who we are. He knows our name. He knows every hair on our head. He knows then what is best for our lives. Did you believe that tonight? I think God's got it all figured out, doesn't he? And sometimes we just get in the way. We get in the way. We let maybe our thoughts, our emotions get in the way. We, we, we tend to just have a, 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 for a better lack of the word, perverted sense at times of just how things really ought to be. God has it all figured out. Psalm 139, verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And we see a lot of verses like that in Scripture, don't we? I was even convicted about this in my life, and I'll just pass this along you, to you tonight just for a little bit of a side note. When is the last time you've done that? 
just to look up at your creator and praise him because he made you. Something I don't think about often, something that just the Lord laid in my heart that I'm going to try to think about a little more in my life. See, we get so caught up in everything around us and how things are going and the busyness of the schedule and the psalmist cried out, wait a minute, if I'm going to praise God, I'm going to praise him with everything I have. Why? Because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He goes on to say, marvelous are thy works that my soul knoweth right well. If you're a child of God tonight, you have that same sense of emotion. You should. Reading that scripture, hearing that scripture, it should stir you up a bit and you should look to the skies, you should look to the heavens and say, God, thank you so much for the effort you put into me. You have a purpose for me. You have a plan for me. You know everything about me. There's not a thing about me that he doesn't know. There's not a thing about you God doesn't know either. This is a God that knows us so well. He knows every hair on your head. Imagine the detail of that. That's just not my hairs, by the way. Which sadly, I look in the sink every morning and there's more and more in there. God's got them all counted. And it's not just me. It's you. It's all of his creation. And not only does he know those hairs, he knows us. He knows who we are. He knows what we're going through. We have a sense that there are times where maybe he's in another room or he's across the street or he's down the way or he's in another town. God is never away from his children. He will never leave us or forsake us. He takes care of his creation. You know, when you consider life this way, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, when you have this foundation, then life is precious. That's why we in this church and we as Bible-believing Christians, that's why we stand against abortion. It's why we stand against euthanasia, the disposal of the elderly. We stand against assisted suicide. Why? Because of this. We have no right to take such actions against that which was created in God's image. One said when we do such things, we demean what God esteems. Our act of violence is not only against other human beings, it's against God. God calls us to cherish and respect, listen to this, all life. All life. And I know there are circumstances, and this is not an abortion message tonight, there are circumstances that are difficult. But we stand by all life. Don't get into that debate about what happens if someone's raped or molested or evil things. Listen, those are evil things, but God still has a plan. This is one of the things that irritate me most about the conservative party I am in. They'll tell you they're for life. But man, when it gets to that, they throw the exception in, don't they? Most of them do. Why? Why? Because it seems extreme. It seems extreme to say, no, no, there are other ways we can do this. That child can be adopted. That child can be cared for. Was it a terrible experience? Absolutely. But because God is good, because God is gracious, good things can come of it. They just don't want to utter those words. Why? Because they want more votes. Man is unique because he was created in the image of God. That's really our first thought tonight. All of that other was just simple introduction. Man is unique because he was created in the image of God. One said we are not created in the image of a Hollywood star or starlet. 
We're not created in the image of a superstar athlete. We're not created in the image of the power-laden executive. We were created in his image. We were crafted to reflect God's greatness. And it's not of us. It's of him. It's not so the world sees our goodness or our greatness is so that his goodness, his greatness is reflected in us. Being made in God's likeness means that we possess characteristics that are also found in God. Similar to the way that children often reflect the characteristics, mannerisms, and appearances of their parents. It's a neat thing to watch. Still neat for me to see these kids grow. And man, the older they get, it's kind of those mid-teen years is when you look at a young man and think, that kid looks just like his dad. Talks like his dad, has mannerisms like his dad, body motions like his dad. Yes, Greenhaws, you all are just like your dad, I'm telling you what. <laughs> Greg's walking down the road. I thought, there's Scott right there, man. Just everything about you. Same with mine. There are several dimensions to this image of God, and I want to really spend the rest of our time looking at that. What does this mean? What is this image of God all about? There's a spiritual dimension. Man has a body, but he also has a soul and a spirit. There is a triunity of man. Does that sound familiar? That triunity? Because God is a triune God. We know that. We spent time on that. There's God the Father, God the Son, that's Jesus Christ, and God the Spirit, the Holy Ghost. I would consider, if you want to put ourselves in a camp, or at least myself, I, I would kind of consider myself to be a, 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 a I just lost the word now, uh, let's say trichotomist, because that's not the right word. Is it trichotomist? Yes, sir. Still doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> and in that, I'd say I usually describe that man has a body and a soul spirit. Now, there are three elements. There's that, that body, that soul, and spirit. And I, I believe those are those three elements. That's that trichotomy, if you will. But I'm going to break those down tonight. But I also would just specify that soul spirit, they are so closely knit together. Okay? So you can do yourself harm if you try to really break these apart too much. I'll do a little bit tonight just for some understanding. But when you hear me explain this, it's man as a body and man has that soul spirit, if you will. Although there are those three parts. We see this in scripture where even First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 it says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. In other words, man has a body. We see those three parts. That first part is his body. It's that flesh. It's what you see in the mirror every day, whether you like it or not, right? It's that flesh looking back, if you will. One day that flesh is what's going to get buried in the ground when you die. But praise the Lord, if we're here when Jesus Christ comes back, it's that flesh that's going to be raptured. What a day that will be. But then in the air, just miraculously be changed, be glorified. No need to see death. No need then of your body to be raptured when that day comes. We see that body at creation, and we read this verse, and we're going to read it a couple more times by the end of the night, but in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and the Lord God formed man to the dust of the ground. That's the body. That's the flesh. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. That's the body. That's the flesh. It's what we see. All those intricate parts that God placed in this body. But yet you take a couple of things out and there's no life in the body, is there? Even Adam at first was just a body. He was formed to the dust of the ground and then something miraculous happened. God breathed in him the breath of life and he became a living soul. Man also has a soul. We see this in scripture. 
This is the part you cannot see. Self-conscious life, if you will. We would say also animals have souls, but man's are different. The fact that man's soul was God-breathed. It's the part of man that has emotion, desires, affections, understandings. Again, that's the latter part of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? A living soul. Psalm 42, verses 1 through 6, you can turn there tonight, kind of gives us an idea of this aspect of the soul, the emotions of it, the desires of it, the affections, the understanding. Psalm 42, verse 1, as the heart panteth after the water brook, soul panteth my soul after thee, O God. It says, my soul thirsteth for God and for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them with the house of God. For with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holiday... Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan, from the Hermonites, from the hill Mizar. See, we see that body and soul of man, and then that third part is the spirit. Man has a spirit. This is another part you cannot see. It's not like the body, but it is different than the soul. Spirit is that part that knows, if you will. Some have said, described it as the mind, if you will. We would put into this, it's the principle of man's rational of an immortal life. It's the possessor of reason, will, and conscience. The spirit is the part of man that seeks for God. Man's spirit apart from God is never satisfied. That's what we learn in Ecclesiastes. Man's spirit apart from God, man apart from God can't be satisfied. There's nothing to, the, to life. It's just generations that come and go. Yet when you're a child of God, there's meaning to life. Bible talks about this spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit, man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Ecclesiastes 3, 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward to the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? There's an intellectual dimension to man as well as that Spiritual, if you will. We see those three parts, that body, soul, and spirit, and then there's this intellectual dimension. Only human beings can reason and think, analyze and meditate. So there's a time we had a dog. And there are times where, you know, you look at those dogs or your cats or whatever they are. Sometimes cats are weird, but dogs kind of have a little better way about it. You can kind of tell when a dog's happy. Or we say happy, but, right? They greet you, they wag their tail, their eyes kind of light up. Kind of tell when a dog is fearful, right? You ever seen a dog in a thunderstorm? If your dog's scared of lightning or gunshots, they, their eyes change, if you will. They, they have that sense of fear. Some say you can even see when they're kind of sad, right? Maybe you go on a long trip or their loved one is now gone and they're just waiting to greet them. Certainly not the level we do. We're able to weigh options. We wrestle with our conscience. We make reason choices. These traits reflect God's unmatched wisdom. This was that image we were created in. God gave us that body, that soul, that spirit, that part of us that really would seek after, could look to creation and understand that there is a God. That part of us that's made alive when we become a child of God. Then he takes care of even that old body, doesn't he? Like I said a moment ago, there's a day where when we're in heaven, 
this shell we have today is going to be nothing like the one we have in heaven. I have no idea what it's going to look like. I don't know how old you are. I don't know how young you're going to be. I don't know if we're all going to be of the same age, but Bible declares we'll know each other. We'll know who we are. We know there's no marriage in heaven. There's no relationship like that. Jesus Christ is the bride. He's the head of it all. But we consider what that body would be like without the stain of sin. It's unfathomable. But there's coming a day, and you wonder why did God even do that? But he did. He didn't have to, he doesn't have to raise this old body out of the ground and glorify it, but he's going to. Why is that? Right, that soul spirit we talked about a moment ago, that could just contently been in heaven as well for all of eternity, and we'd have never known the difference. See, God even takes care of his creation. There's that intellectual dimension to man. There's a moral dimension to man as well. Man was made intellectually and morally in such a way that there was a kind of integrity about him. This was really dealing with Adam. Nothing false, nothing imperfect, nothing wrong. Put that in context to Adam when he was created. No sin, no pull to sin, right? No illness, no sickness, there was a straightness, an uprightness, one said. There was a truth. There was a balance. It was exactly what is meant to be moral and intellectual integrity, expressing themselves in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4.24, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There's that moral dimension to us. Man knows what's right and wrong. Man inherently knows that there's right and wrong. That's why when we're confronted with our sin, by the word of God, our response should be to repent. Because we know there's right and wrong. We know there's morality of living. The world wants to define that. They want to go a different route and say that, no, we can just make our own choices and there's no authority. There ought to be no things that, you know, interfere with our choices. And yet it start, until it starts to affect other people. And then we even as societies, as state laws and different things like that to rule, right? Because we know things are wrong. We see that spiritual element, the intellectual, the moral element to man, even with the sin nature, if you look closely, you can still see God's image, get a glimpse of his likeness. That's why you and I, as even now believers, been born again, we, we people can see Christ in us. They ought to. I believe we look at all of creation, we can in a sense get that glimpse of who God is. Now we see a world that's lost we see souls that need to be saved. We see sinners that need to repent and come to a relationship with Christ. But those individuals are just as unique of creation as you and I are. God loves them just as much. He knows them just as much as you and I. He paid a great price for them just as much as you and I. Think about that in context just for a moment. See the enormity of the cross we talked about this morning just a bit? You remember, we know scriptures that tell us, that teach us that even before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain, if you will. We talked about this morning, was it Dennis, the fullness of time? Was that you and I talking about that, brother? In the fullness of time? And Dennis had an interesting point. Well, Dennis's points are always interesting, but... <laughs> He said this morning, you know, of all things, you know, think of Christ came in our day and age. You know, there could have just been a lethal injection or, you know, uh, an uh, electrification, if you will, right? That electric chair. But yet God in the fullness of time placed him at, in a time in history where it was just the most gruesome way to die. In the fullness of time. 
my thought was this, if God, even before the creation of the world, even before the foundation of the world, he knew that his son was going to go to the cross, yet he put so much time and effort in creating you and I. We are so unique. We are so fearfully made. It's a wonderful thing. He breathed into us the breath of life. He imprinted upon us those parts of him, those characteristics of who he is, and then he provided a way to save us knowing we would sin, knowing that we would do evil in his sight, knowing we would disobey. On top of that, he miraculously saves us when we repent of this sin, when we turn to the cross, when we turn to Jesus Christ, and then God is still actively working in the life of his creation. Are there things that happen to us physically that we don't like? Absolutely, but God's still there. He's still giving graces. He's still just putting exactly what we need into place exactly when we need it. And then, as I said a moment ago, there's going to be a day where then even now this sin-cursed body will be glorified. What a God that is. You can't think of this God and dismiss these truths. We were created unique so that God could reveal to us the wonder of his glory. There's a purpose to life. To honor, to glorify our heavenly father. That's our purpose. Have fellowship with him. We are made to uniquely reflect the nature and character of God. I put a question in this, it's for me as well, and that is, how well are we reflecting that nature? Next time you look in the mirror, ask yourself this question. Do others see Christ in me? Those are hard moments sometimes, aren't they? You ever stare back at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself that question. Do others see Christ in me? If there's areas that you need to fix, change them. There's areas that you need to give to the Lord, give them to the Lord. But don't go another day just being like that man that sees his reflection and walks away. He sees the disheveledness, he notices the imperfections, and he doesn't even do anything about them. He just turns about face and goes about his daily life. We were made to have fellowship with God. Are you in then spending time with him? We consider if we're reflecting Christ, if others see Christ in us, if God wants this fellowship with his creation, especially his child, well then, are we truly spending time with him? Just to say, God, you are so good. God, I, am, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We could go on every day thanking him and just spending time with him, but yet we don't, do we? There are times we may have lapses in our life. There are times where we'll have lapses in our day or our week or maybe unfortunately your month where you just don't spend the time with God, yet he's there wanting and yearning for that relationship with his creation and especially you, his child. You see, even if you're not seeking him, he still knows how many hairs are on your head. Even though you're not calling out to him, he still knows exactly what you and I need. Even though we may not be in the word and spending time with him in prayer, he is such a God that loves us, that cherishes his creation, that he knows exactly what we need in our daily lives. And often how good he is, is he grants it. Even those moments we're not in fellowship. 
Even in those moments where maybe we're not spending time or maybe we just haven't put the effort in, God often is still there blessing you and I. Why? Because we're a unique creation. Man is unique. Don't be caught up in the world's mindset of thinking. Don't let the world diminish this book in any way, shape, or form or the truth in it. And tonight, leave here praising God that you and I as man are uniquely formed, are uniquely fashioned, and this God of the universe wants a relationship with you and I. If you're a child of God tonight, we have that relationship. We know what that's like. Let's spend some time with him. Let's, let's truly reflect inwardly and truly ask that question, God, if, if you made me to bring honor and glory to you, to praise you, to have a relationship with you, to have fellowship with you, then God, am I really modeling your son like I should? God, are these characteristics that you have implanted on me, are these part of my life? Do others see them? Let's live for him with all we are, with all we have. And at the end of the day, let's leave this place like the psalmist, just praising him for how great our creator is. Let's pray tonight. Father, we are so thankful. We are so grateful for these truths in your word. God, you uniquely formed man out of the dust of the ground. You breathed into Adam the breath of life and man became a living soul. We're thankful, Lord, that we see these three elements of life, if you will, that we have a body, a soul, a spirit, all working together, all fashioned by you. And oh God, that spirit that if we're a child of God that has just been made alive, what a wonderful truth that is. Help us, Lord, as we think about and reflect on these scriptures, the uniqueness of how you made us, that we then truly would reflect those characteristics you want us to reflect. That we would live like you, that the world would see Jesus Christ in us, that we'd ask that question of ourselves tonight. Maybe there are some here, Father, that have just been challenged because they understand how uniquely made they are and God, they're just not spending time with you like they ought to in fellowship. Lord, through your spirit, you've spoken to their heart and God, I pray that they would commit even tonight to spend some more time with you each day, to fellowship with their creator, to fellowship with their heavenly father, to just at times praise you for who you are in our lives. Oh, we fall so short of that. We of all people should be before your throne more and more every day. Lord, we thank you for the life you've given us. We thank you that even in death, this whole body will be glorified. We thank you that you provided a way even for that in your foreknowledge. Thank you for your goodness tonight. Work in our invitation. Work in each heart that's here, Lord. Help us just to spend some time praising you for how good you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor.